it's spring. Thus this change in framed illustration. Every Monday seems to sneak up on me and I'm trying to get as much work done as possible before my guests arrive today. So first on the list is making a PDF version of my mini sketchbook tour. All in all, the PDF version came out to 45 spreads or 90 pages of drawings and paintings. Not too bad. This little guy is now available for download. Beyond that, I have a few illustrations due for the Southern Poverty Law Center tomorrow. This series is about the Tulsa Race Massacre and how local educators are working to bring light to it via an official curriculum. This one presented a challenge in balancing the sensitivity and nuance needed in reference to the subject matter, while also reflecting a reclamation of history via the classroom. There's still more to go tomorrow, but in the meantime, our guests are here. Nice to meet you, Nia. She's briefly visiting with my friend before they both return to Massachusetts. Nia is the new studio temp worker. Though for now, she has the night off. Will she be staying awake to watch some episodes of The Bachelor with us? Who's to say? Let's get that work for the Southern Poverty Law Center all finished up. Luckily, my temp assistant is here to assist. Since I already have a color palette somewhat locked in from yesterday, today we're gonna use a combo of the lasso tool and brush called Ultimate Pastel Palooza to put in shading and highlights throughout the piece. When color picking for the shadows and highlights, I tend to use analogous colors and lightly adjusted tones to lend a more cohesive look. And when it comes to adding texture, I'll put a brighter, more saturated color down, then paint over it with my base color with a somewhat lighter pressure. That way, a little pop of the underpainting shines through. With all this attention to the balance of hues and color interactions, it's also important to check out the balance of tones, not just for viewers who might be colorblind, but also to bring a greater distinguishment of the shapes and figures. To do this, I usually add an adjustment black and white layer at the top of all my layers, then flip it on and off periodically while drawing to check how the tones are contrasting with one another. Sometimes assistants get tired on the job and they need walks. As a partial employer, you should be accommodating to employee health and well-being. Youth was a real champ about relieving herself in 40 degree Fahrenheit weather, but her tiny booty got cold quickly. Luckily, the short walk was just enough to sustain me through the rest of the illustrations. I borrowed colors from the main illustration via the eyedrop tool to use in the accompanying spot illustrations. Overall, this makes the set of illustrations way more cohesive in terms of a color palette. Not to mention it also makes life a bit easier for the illustrator by not having to find entirely new colors. Here's how each of the finished illustrations turned out. By the time 5 p.m. rolled around, we could wrap everything up. Of course, after that, Niath and I unwound with some vlogs until my friend returned from her day in the city and we wrapped up the evening by hanging out. The days are getting longer, which means the sunlight reaches less and less through my south-facing windows. Also, you may have already noticed, but I hung a diptych I made of these cranes between the windows. They're a very loose knockoff of a Gucci wallpaper that I really loved but could not afford. 
My friend and her dog may have already returned back to their home, but that's slightly convenient because this morning I have a kickoff call with a new client that I'm quite excited about, and hopefully I get to divulge who it's for soon enough. It's probably the largest job of my career thus far, and naturally I'm nervous to meet them. Only it turns out that I got the date of the meeting wrong and we're actually meeting tomorrow. This is the face of someone figuring out they are in the meeting room on the wrong day. Joining calls usually takes me quite a bit to gear up to, so I guess we'll have to do this again tomorrow. For now, I'll just work on editing the sketchbook tour that I filmed. It's the first time in a while I managed to complete a sketchbook and with painted spreads, so I'm happy with how it turned out. A couple of years from now, when I thumb through it, perhaps it'll bring back memories. It's finally meeting time. Hi, nice to meet you. How's it going? Now that that's over with, I'll watch a bit of Ranking of Kings while I doodle. These are a few characters for a comic I've been thinking about for a while now, but the format of it keeps changing in my head, so I still have a lot to work out. All I can say is that it takes place in the space biodome, where the characters go to lose their memories. I also took some notes during the kickoff call earlier, so even though I don't have specs for the dimensions of the illustration, I can at least get a head start on dynamic poses, focusing mostly on movement. I've started a new mini sketchbook recently. While my last mini sketchbook was a Luke term, this one's a moleskin, and I look forward to perhaps filming another mini sketchbook tour someday. The friend who visited kindly gifted me with this lovely watercolor pencil set, so I'm very excited to try it out for the first time. Just setting expectations here though, this is my first foray into watercolors, so don't expect anything too fancy. Strangely, most of the things I draw, I don't even show to other people. And then when I think about it later, it's like, what have I been doing this whole time? That's part of what makes an artist's lifestyle a bit lonely for me sometimes. One of the underlying reasons I suppose I started drawing was to create my own little world. However, it was also so I could share that world with other people and form a bridge of connection or communication. After all, what's the point of visiting a fantastic place if you can't take other people? Back to my original point, and this may come as a surprise, but I often don't enjoy the things that I create. As a result, I end up not showing other people what it is I've created. It's something I need to work on, but it can definitely happen as a result of monetizing the thing that you love. For a while now, I've been leaning into more traditional media as a means of changing up my process. My thought is that if I can shift the process enough, I can trick myself into becoming more in tune with the journey of the making, rather than the result or the finished piece. 
I'm sure this all must sound incredibly obvious to you, but it is very hard to break the feedback loop of a habit that has served you in the past but has no longer become tenable. So what happens, change is not just inevitable, but also necessary. Anyway, here's how it turned out. That was a nice little warm up, so I'm going to spend the rest of my day working on sketches for the client job I'm on. I'm still focused on creating a sense of movement and energy while keeping in mind the brand's voice. Really what we're going for with these client sketches is to start off really loose just to ascertain a basic composition as well as a line of movement. And then we're going to trace over them later on and solidify the sketches so that they can be presented to the client. With client work wrapped up for today, I'm going to chill with volume one of Akira that I picked up from the Brooklyn Public Library. I think this is my first time since 2019 actually checking out a physical book from the library. But at the end of the day, it is nice to hold a comic in your hands. Honestly, the level of detail that Katsuhiro Otomo draws with is obscene. I once read that the number of cross-hatching strokes he employed while depicting a large implosion in the manga was meant to signify the number of fictional lives taken in the blast. But obviously it can be connected to the trauma of World War II. Anyway, Akira is a classic, with every panel a mini masterpiece. I look forward to reading the entire series. Since we spent a ton of time in the studio this week, let's treat ourselves and refuel the old creative drive by heading to Mocha. I have to say, in all my years of attending, I've never seen a line like this to get in before. If you haven't heard of it before, Mocha stands for the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art, and it's a weekend-long festival, usually held in April, where artists sell art, zines, comics, and other merch to the general public in person. There is also a lecture series that accompanies it, the guest speakers usually being well-renowned artists within the community. Today I attended a lecture with Mike Bignola, who's largely known for being the creator of Hellboy. I wasn't sure what to expect walking into the talk, but I actually found it to be exactly what I needed at the time. Mignola talked a lot about the things he most disliked in life, steering him toward the things he knew he could grow a fascination for. For example, being what he considered a bad penciler, driving him toward being an inker. Being bad at inking other artists' work, driving him to create his own fantastical worlds while inking his own work. Hating to draw cars and architecture, causing him to invent worlds where he didn't have to draw these things. And how he took a six year break from working on comics when the Hellboy film came out because the added layer of an audience made art making paralyzing. It was refreshing to hear an artist so frank about his failings, which isn't something you often see behind all the work. By the way, here's everything I bought for Mocha. I can't wait to hang my prints and read my zines. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time.